Hello out there in the YouTube universe. It is Max. It is Jared down Hi. there. Hi. And we are doing another pauper primer for all of you out there. We are one half of Superliminal Games, just for you who are keeping track at home. That's math. Yes. Everyone loves math. They do. They do? No. Math is for blockers. I don't intend to block. <laughs> uh, not with some of the cards that have come out. No. So, we are here to talk about the new Crimson Vow and its implications for Arena Pauper specifically. We talked about in the last one how we're going to start to step away from Pauper on the whole. And we'll mention it here and there, but I think oh, there's yeah. enough resources out there that with Arena Pauper being harder to find, we're going to focus in on that for a lot of these videos. Again, let us know in the comments if you want to see more just generic Pauper stuff. We can certainly open it up and talk a little bit more about that as well. Yeah. And I'll certainly mention the cards that are impacting the format as we get to them. But we want to focus in on Arena Pauper because Arena Pauper is sweet. Absolutely. So let's talk about the first card. And that's going to open up a whole conversation, Jared, because there is one archetype in Arena Pauper that is getting a tremendous boost. Yes. From Crimson Val, and it makes sense because it's crimson, it's red. Absolutely. Yep. I'm... So, red is too good right now. It's going to be very good. Yeah. The first card we have up, it's already a card that's legal in Pauper. It was already, but it's not in Arena Pauper until now. Yeah. This is a braid. So if you're not familiar, an instant for one and a red, and you get to pick. You get an option here, which it's is not something you often get at common. And in red. Yeah. So you get to either deal three damage to a creature or destroy an artifact. That's uh, real good. It's very Either strong. option. Very strong. I really like the flexibility of it. The destroy target artifact isn't super relevant yet, so I don't know if we'll see a ton of this out of the gate. But one in a red instant is not a bad place to be with the level of flexibility you get as more artifacts get printed. Yep. If we see a return to affinity or another historic horizons that supports an artifact based deck, I could see this becoming a weapon of choice for a lot of red decks, especially more controlling or mid rangey red decks. Yeah, like the more like common equipment they print, they're going to accidentally print a really good one that yep. they're, it's going to be an arena pauper for at least a little while. Absolutely. Because it's bound to happen. Yes, 100%. And as we've seen, there's only been one ban in Arena Pauper ever, and that's the Persistent petition Petitioners. So yep. you really have to be a card that completely changes how the format is played for them to acknowledge it. Absolutely. So moving on to some cards that I think will see relative immediate play in the format. The first one is Ancestral Anger. This one is a Sorcery for Single Red. Target creature gains Trample and gets plus X plus zero until end of turn, where X is one plus the number of cards named Ancestral Anger in your graveyard. Draw a card. So we've seen this effect yeah. on something like a Rite of Flame before, or the, uh, what's the card that makes to the Goblin Tokens? That particular card uh, from Ravnica Block, the newest Ravnica Block. I forget the name Goblin of it. Gathering? That might be correct, Perhaps. yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. And it's looking at other versions of this in the graveyard. That being said, I really think this is kind of the push. If you haven't been on the mono red style Kiln Fiend decks or Prowess decks, whatever you want to call them, if you haven't been on those yet, I really think that this is the push to get away from blue red. I think you need to get away from your cantrips and get into the mono red build. So in this slot, the, the card that this is upgrading for me is Ryle, which is, it deals one damage to a creature you control, and it gives it Trample and draw the card. So this was kind of my filler. I think it's at a three of right now. This is just a strict upgrade to that card. It's not, that's not hindering me in any way. I don't have to worry about, oh no, now my Kiln Fiend gets blown out by some kind of weird little ping. Yeah. I don't have to worry about any of that stuff now. I don't have to wait to target a Burning Prophet. I can just... Ancestral Anger, and continue to cantrip, which is really powerful. And the Trample is... I mean, the reason I was playing Ryle is for Trample. You, com you yeah. combo this with um, War Leader Strike or Warlord's Fury. Warlord's Fury, maybe? Warlord's Fury. And give everything first strike and Trample. And this is a con it's a combination that Jared loves. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I, I like Crash Through, but 
the the incremental power upgrade, I think, is more important because they're usually only worried about one creature getting bigger anyway. Right, and I think the the beauty of the mono red build of this deck is you get to play Crash Through and Ancestral Anger. You get to play yep. them both. And it's Absolutely. just like, you know what, don't have to pick. And this works really well when you're on just no Kiln Fiend, but you're trying to just get there with your Burning Prophet, or you're trying to get there with your uh, the 2-1 that deals the damage whenever you cast a non-creature spell. Firebrand Archer. Thank you, Firebrand Archer. When you're on those guys, it's sometimes really hard to force through those last couple points of damage. This card lets you do it. And it also lets me segue nicely into the next card, which is very close to Firebrand Archer. <laughs> yes, it is. And I did bring up Goblin Gathering on screen for just a second, and it was what we wanted. Nice. But so this this, this one here, ooh. this is a good, this is a great discussion card because it is exactly Firebrand Archer. But instead of a 2-1, you now have a 1-3 with the Kessig Flame Breather. And yeah. Still, still human. I think the, the secondary creature type or the class may change. But same effect. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, it deals one damage to each opponent. Yeah, I think the archer is specifically an archer. And this makes is a, sense. a shaman. So. Yeah. So not really relevant in pauper, either, either thing. Human, slightly more so than the other things. Possibly, yeah. But the stat line is the interesting one. So I think if you were to tool your red decks to where you want to run, you could definitely get away with, I'm playing Thermo Alchemist in four, I'm playing Kessig Flame Breather in four, and I'm playing the Firebrand Archer in four, and I'm just pulling away from Burning Prophet or the uh, the Elementals or the Weirds or whatever you're doing in yeah. your prowess deck. You're pulling away from that to be less interactive and just more face damage, which I think is acceptable, largely. Yeah. So it's definitely... It, what's neat is we get to see branching archetypes. We've already seen, like, a red aggro deck and a red spells deck. And I think the Kiln Fiend deck kind of is the, the one that bridges the gap and dances between the two. Mm -hmm. But now this helps further that gap where it's like, you know what? Do I even feel like dealing with a combat step? Or am I just going to cast instants and sorceries that draw me more cards? draw me to more of these effects and keep meanwhile just getting like between one and four points of free damage on top of whatever I'm dealing. Yeah, like Kiln Fiend works almost like a combo deck where this works more like just aggressive burn. Yeah, it's a great value deck. I think if you wanted to stick to blue and you're just like, no, my ops are too good, I have to play them, I think you want to build a configuration a little closer to Thermo Alchemist, Flame Breathers, and Archers. Yeah. Because then you're just getting, you're actually getting more value and more incremental value and your cards that cost multiple blue get there a little bit better than something like the the red weird does i don't think it quite does enough yeah to help you out the way you want but i think the flame breather helps fill that spot if you really want to push to blue red i think you're you're going to be less interactive and leaning more on these guys to deal your deal your massive damage mm -hmm. to your opponent maybe try to win with like a couple serpentine curve if you need it or something like that yeah. we put fling in the deck and play serpentine curve that's extra sweet oh that's that's a fun one <laughs> so let's move on to the card another card and kind of the card this is it this is the best card this may be the best card we talk about tonight uh possibly this card is absolutely absurd it is seeing play of course in real deal pauper this card is reckless impulse it's one in a red it's a sorcery you exile the top two cards of your library until the end of your next turn, you may yeah. play, specifically play, those cards. So even if it's two lands, unless you play the land on the turn you cast this, you can still use both of them. Yeah, this and is that's such a big deal. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. And if I haven't convinced you to go mono red yet with your cantrippy Kiln Fiend decks, I can't say any more than this card. Yeah. This card does so much heavy lifting. Like Jared said, it lets you hit your land drops. It lets you play a lower land count, which is so important in Pauper, because mm -hmm. if you flood, you lose most of the time. Yeah. So it really helps you make use of the lands. If you don't need the excess lands, one in a red, if I had one in, like, one in a red sorcery, trigger my Kiln Fiends, trigger my, my Flame Breathers, my Thermo Alchemist, and then just take two mountains out of your deck, I'd consider playing that card. Yeah. Certainly in Pauper, it's just like, just remove two mountains from your from your deck. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> yeah. So if that's the worst you're getting off this, so be it. 
Otherwise, it can go... Imagine a turn, it's like fifth turn or something. You have out a, a flame breather or two, or a thermo alchemist and a flame breather, and you get to start your turn with impulse into single red cantrip, into single red cantrip. It's just... You're talking yeah. four to five damage before combat. If you don't, and if you have a kiln fiend out, obviously things become a lot worse for the opponent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Holy crap! This can get out of hand real fast in the later turns for red. Absolutely, it's. We talk about how close to a dead draw a lot of the cards in the red deck can feel like they are, and why the draw card is so important if you're playing mono red. Mm-hmm. This card is the opposite of all of that. It's so good. Yeah. It's it's going to make me move away, I think. Because there's so many single red cards that are good now, I think I'm going to move away from playing Sunscorch Desert. I'll probably move to a configuration that's either all mountains or mountains plus, like, two Forgotten Cave. Uh, yeah. So that I can just use these cards and take super advantage and not worry about... Because if my turn... If using this card, you can use a Sunscorch Desert, but if you're on, like, Sunscorch Desert, Sunscorch Desert in on the battlefield, it makes cards like... This one's significantly worse because you can't just trip off the turn you cast it if you need to in the later game because your generic mana be kind of clogs you up a little bit. You can't just cast your ancestral anger into crash through. You're like, yeah, you know, I you, got, the yeah. colorless mana ruined me. It kills you to get pinched on it, and it just uh-huh. may not be worth it. No, I love getting extra value out of my lands, especially in pauper because there's so few lands in arena pauper that you can get extra value on. Mm-hmm. But one trading off one damage versus a turn I could potentially win that I couldn't have won. Like, this could win me the game out of nowhere or take me back on a game that I wasn't going to win. Just seems more valuable. Absolutely. So, yeah. What a, what a set of upgrades for Red. Yeah. Good for you, Red. Yeah, you've earned it. Yeah, holy crap. It was already a pillar of the format, and it just got so many more toys. So the next grouping of cards I want to talk about are a little bit more speculative. These are kind of like good role players or possibly good cards that could see play in certain archetypes. And you'll see what I mean when we look at the first card. The first card we're looking at is a black card. It's not red anymore, even though we're in Crimson Vow. It is a courier bat. It is two and a black for a bat. It has flying, probably because it's a bat. Bat? When it, <laughs> bat. When it enters the battlefield, if you gained life this turn, return up to one target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So this card's really really good at getting back the high-priority targets that exist in the black-red, like, drain and gain deck. Yeah. This card's awesome with Ill-Gotten Inheritance. Mm -hmm. It just does so much work in these kinds of decks. It's a nice little flyer that's a role player. Normally in this slot, I'd be playing the... The Vampire, it's been in a couple of the core sets that when it enters the battlefield, it does a little gain and drain. They lose a life, you gain a life. Yeah, I can't think of that one at the moment. No, and that's usually like, that'd be like a two of in these decks. I think I could expand on, remove that completely now, put in the Courier Bat, and Mm -hmm. use that to gain, because one of the high priority targets in the deck is immediately killing anything that when you gain life, they lose life. So your Epicures of Blood, yep. the the 3-2 Cleric that does it from Zendikar, it, those are, st- like, they come down and they die immediately. Your opponent's like, oh yeah. crap, I have to kill that on the spot. Absolutely. And Courier Bat's just like, don't worry, I got you. Just keep gaining some life. <laughs> so it's a, it's a nice, flexible role player. It keeps pressure. It's evasive. I think it does a lot of things really nicely. It fails the shock test, but I think my Raise Dead, having a condition is fine on a 2-2 body, right? Raise dead costs the black. So we're getting 2-2 flyer for two generic mana on this card as long as we gain the life. And the life gain deck is so good at that. Mm -hmm. So if you're playing mono black or white black life gain, your deck's so good at that. If you're playing the white black version, you can get back your soul wardens that died immediately. And you can just, there's so much you can do to keep yourself into the mid and late game with the courier bat. I think it's a nice role player. Definitely worth a two of slot in those decks. I'm almost certain. Yeah, and I think the way it's worded, if you have out a soul warden, that can be the life you need to gain to make it work. Because mm-hmm. I think you can stack the triggers in a way to where it would actually go off. I do believe you're correct. But, and like, I'm looking at this as a cheaper grave digger that right. has flying. And yeah. to me, that seems amazing. Exactly, exactly. It's Grave Digger is a house and limited and always has been. Yeah. This being an evasive version of that. And the deck's already designed to gain life. So you're just kind of going to do that for free. 
and just being able to throw this in there as an evasive way to pressure your opponent further and get back resources that are really critical to the deck operating seems like a slam dunk. Absolutely. Here's a less certain card <laughs> coming up for the Hexproof deck. It is Lantern Bearer. He's a 1-1 one, one for 1 with flying. He is, yeah. in fact, flying men. He's a spirit, though. Not yep. a man. Well, was once a man, perhaps. We don't know. It's hard to say. Could have just been it a is. lantern. That's right. But it transforms into a two and a blue. You get to disturb it, and it becomes an enchantment that gives plus one, plus one, and flying to the enchanted creature. And then, obviously, if it goes to the graveyard, you just get rid of it, so you can't just keep redisturbing it. Yeah, but that's still pretty nice. It's not bad, right? Like, if you need to, you can always slap this down as a 1-1 one, one flyer, hold up your ranger's guile, your snakeskin veil to keep it alive, and then attach your auras to it to try to push through a win or gain yourself back some life or whatever you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. But on the backside, if it dies early, you kind of don't care because then you get to play Lantern's Lift and put it on your hexproof creature and make it an actual evasive threat still. And yeah. it's not quite as good as plus two, plus two and flying, but for one more mana, plus one, plus one, and flying on half of a card isn't bad. Mm -hmm. It lets me in the blue decks also loot a little bit more aggressively than I was. So I think there's some options. I don't think it's necessarily a slam dunk like Courier Bat is in the deck, but it could be a really nice role player for the deck. You can discard it to looting effects and just be like, I don't care. It becomes an enchantment, it's something that actually interacts out of the graveyard. And I was playing the green card that gives plus one, plus one, and trample and that you can return it from the graveyard to your hand to give me something to do in the graveyard. Yeah. So that doesn't hurt. I get to loot a little bit more aggressively and kind of filter my draws, because it's just a little easier to loot than it is to just draw raw cards in Pauper, both for mana reasons and how short the games tend to be, because mm -hmm. the decks are more aggressive. So Lantern Bearer might see some play. You never know. It could, yeah. So Lantern Bearer, from there we do another one drop. It's a single white drop this time. It's a human cleric, traveling minister. Until uh, He has a tap ability. Target creature gets plus one, plus O oh until end of turn. You gain a life. You can only activate this as a sorcery. So when I first saw this card, I completely wrote it off. For limited, I wrote it off for... Yep. Certainly wrote it off for pause. I was like, I don't care about this card. Who cares? Yeah, I was honestly surprised when you said the name of it when we were setting up to record. Yeah, so after seeing this in Limited, I've realized what an absolute house it is. Yeah. And I think it's it's so... The cost of putting it in your deck is so little. If you're pl Especially if you're playing Mono White or White Black Life Gain. Boy, oh boy. This thing is just a free source of life gain every turn. You can obviously target itself. It doesn't target another creature. It can target itself. Yeah. It doesn't do anything, obviously, if you intend to attack with it because it becomes tapped. But if you need to gain that life, it becomes really important. The other thing this is good in is if you're playing just like the Go Wide Token Soul Warden style deck, this can make your tokens actually tangle with real cards on the opponent's board. Yeah, it could, yeah. And you're just gaining life while you're doing it, keeping the minister safe. It's surprisingly versatile in a couple of these builds, and I think it'll end up sneaking its way in to a few of them. I mean, imagine first turn, first turn Suntail Hawk, second turn to get a Traveling Minister... And you get to ta start tapping the minister to increase the Suntail Hawk's power. All of a sudden, you're gaining a bunch of life. It becomes a clock, yeah. And it's like partial lifelink. It's kind of interesting. It's really good. And I think it these the potency of the life gain deck needs to be there because it needs to be able to answer red in the format. Yeah. So we need the white decks to be able to fight against how fast and robust the red decks options are getting. So seeing something like Traveling Minister, seeing something like Courier Bat is really encouraging that the life gain decks still do matter. Yeah, and honestly, it's such an underwhelming card. People won't remove it immediately until you've gained like four or five life off of it. Right. And for one mana, even if you've only hit for an extra like one or two damage, that's not bad. No, it's so. surprisingly flexible. Like this is a he like I've, I'm impressed with in limited how high of a pick this has become, and it wouldn't surprise me at all to start seeing like three to four of these in every pauper deck that's angling around life gain. Yeah, it's pretty wild to think about. Yeah, it's very good, and for such a low cost, one mana, and it's a free tap. Like it's just so. G all right, it's a sorcery. Okay, sounds sounds fine. Yeah, I, I accept. <laughs> I accept he'll never block. It's fine. Whatever. Pretty much. I like it. 
Moving on to the next one is a card that if you if you've watched any of these before, you will know one of my favorite decks to play in the format is the zombie deck, which was our first real tribal deck that was successful. Yeah, so good. It was it was it ended up being really good. It had a lot of ability to gain value, and then elves came out and was just like, oh, now there can be multiple tribes. But the zombie deck is a personal favorite of mine. It's gotten so much better with Midnight Hunt coming out and getting the Siege Zombie as part of the deck. I think the Mind Leech Ghoul is a nice upgrade over the last couple shabby two drops we had. Yeah. So it's a 2-2 for two, and it has Exploit. So Exploit, when it enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice a creature. This includes itself, keep in mind. You can Mm -hmm. just immediately exploit it if you want to play it as a sorcery. So when it exploits, each opponent exiles a card from their hand. This plays really nicely in the deck with the one-drop zombie that lets you tap and sacrifice itself to have your opponent discard. Yep. So out of nowhere, you can kind of just mind rot your opponent. Yeah, Lillian is stored. Yeah, if uh, you're on a locked board and you have out like a seed zombie, it's like, all right, in time I can win, or if your opponent just can't really block, it's like, you know what, the cards in their hand might get them back into the game. I'm just going to get rid of both of them right now. Absolutely. It's really a nice, flexible option. 2-2 is good enough. I still am looking for another good one-drop zombie to round out the deck, but I think that this is a nice upgrade to what we have on the two-drop slots. We had a couple shabby ones still in there that can get replaced. So mm-hmm. definitely check that out. Check out the pop-up video. That's got the zombie deck in it, so you can see it in its newest formation and add the Mind Leech Ghoul where you think is appropriate. Yep. So here's another card that starts with the letter M. That's the best segue I got. <laughs> it's Mulch. So this is another card that existed. Another card that sees Fringe play occasionally in Actual Pauper. Not too, too frequently, but occasionally a graveyard deck will want to play this. So it's one in a green sorcery. Reveal the top four cards of your library. You put all the land cards revealed this way into your hand, and the rest into your graveyard. So what is this card, and why why am I mentioning it? Like, who cares about lands in my hand in Pauper? And that's a fair point. There's nothing that really takes a huge advantage of lands in your hand in Pauper. But there are some cards that can interact out of your graveyard in Pauper that are actually kind of valuable. So you have Escape, which is pretty pretty nice mechanic that pairs with Mulch well. Mm-hmm. You also have something like Sanitarium Skeleton that can come back from the graveyard when you have extra mana. Works really well if you're playing like an aristocrat sacrifice kind of deck, because this is the kind of card that can gain you card advantage. So you get to get a bunch of lands out of the way, possibly put cards that do stuff into your graveyard... And then be able to use those cards from the graveyard again. Obviously, we had Flashback come back. We have Disturb, we've already mentioned, in this primer. So there's a lot of things you can do to make your deck very flexible and kind of use Mulch as the engine to start putting cards into your graveyard. So I'm anxious to see what people can do with it. It's kind of more of a Brewer's Paradise. I know for sure, I'm, well, I don't know for sure, because I have Grizzly. We have Grizzly Salvage already. And that's what I'm playing currently in my Aristocrat style deck. Yeah. But if I need to get lands into my hand for discarding purposes, there might be a couple discard cards, and we may look at one down the line uh, that help it. Then so be it. We'll kind of we'll kind of look at two cards that pair nicely with Mulch on the next two as the next two pop up. So the next one obviously is pretty apparent because it's the kind of a level one. <laughs> yeah. bit of interaction it's some of the most obvious you can get this is persistent specimen it's a one one for one you get to pay three return it from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped simple enough yeah we also had a similar card in Str- uh not Str- is it strict saving what's the one with the schools strict saving strict saving okay good for some reason i talked myself out of that being the right set but we had the uh, the one one for one with menace that you can pay two in a black and exile it from your graveyard to draw a card. Yep, unwilling ingredient. Ingredient, yeah, very similar card to the specimen. Both do things from your graveyard. Both are kind of good ideas, right? Like the specimen plays very well with things that want to sacrifice. So if you're using like plagued Rasalka, if you're using the uh, from Strixhaven as well, the Bayou Groff, all yeah. these things play so well with persistent specimen that it's hard to ignore its potency. And instead of Sanitarium Skeleton, where you have to pay to get it back to your hand, or same with the uh, the card from uh, Ikoria, that you pay a little bit of the two-drop, the two-two-for-two, two that you get to pay to return it to your hand. 
this one gets to come right back onto the battlefield, like reassembling skeleton style. Yeah. So it is a nice role player. Obviously, these decks we're talking about, these kind of graveyard synergy decks are mid-range decks, but I think that they do have some potency. And maybe, it depends on the format. Like, obviously, we saw a bunch of red cards that are super powerful. It's going to be hard for this deck to beat those red decks because how the heck do you live? But if you can figure out the life gain part of it and kind of start to build something from there, I think these decks do have a decent shot. Another card that is in a similar vein is this Ragged Recluse. It's a 2-1 for 2. At the beginning of your end step, if you've discarded a card, you get to transform it. Sorry, so that's like pretty medium card. Why am I bringing it up? Well, the backside is a 3-3 that when it attacks, defending player loses a life and you gain a life. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's a nice rate. 2-1 for 2 is not that bad. Obviously fails the shock test. But if you can do something like put it down and then discard a card, like maybe turn three, you're using something to discard a card, it's pretty nasty because it can just flip and then start attacking. If this thing attacks, it's like, man, that's such a big deal. Just getting that trigger one time can be good enough. And it eats a blocker. It passes the shock test. doesn't quite pass the frostbite test. Yeah. But... That I mean, outside of that, and then you start to get the two mana, you're even, right? You're mana even. If they abrade your recluse, that's not that big of a deal. You're both down a card. You're both down uh, two mana. Not a big deal. You're, you're pretty neutral. But anything else is kind of a big win for you outside of something like a uh, uh, Tendrils of Corruption. Yep. So this is pretty good. I don't know if it'll find a home, but it can certainly be pretty nasty in these decks, especially if you're going to start discarding for value, which certainly we've seen a lot of looting, a lot of rummaging. So I think that it's not that hard to think that this card might find a home in a deck that's just trying to hurry up and push cards through its hand. So not too bad. Yeah. This next card doesn't really have a home because there's no archetype specifically that it fits in too easily. But what you're getting for a single green mana is super hard to ignore. Yeah. So this is Massive Might. It's a single green instant. Target creature gets plus two, plus two, which is worse than giant growth, right? But you're losing one power and one toughness in boost to give trample until end of turn. That seems very strong. It's really good, and it's a nice trick. It helps you dodge removal. It helps you attack really hard. It just kind of does everything you want it to do. I don't know where the home for this card is yet, if it finds a home. It's just worth noting for one single mana, you're getting a ton of value out of this card. Like, you can really completely hose a possible removal spell. It can eat a blocker. And you're getting the trample, so you're going to get probably at least one or two points of damage in over top of what's going on for your opponent. So it can do a lot, especially if you're yeah. a low-to-the-ground aggro deck. Yeah, I can Maybe. see it possibly if you want to do, like, the not mono-red, but if you want to, like, add a little bit of other things, because then you can run things like Snakeskin Veil or Ranger's Guile to right. protect the creatures that you're trying to get pushing through, so... Absolutely. Like it, it could be in a Kiln Fiend build as a red-green instead of a red-blue. So. Yeah, that'd be cool. And then you get to play... Uh, what's, it, is it, what's the... Uh, there's Crash Through, and then there's a green version of it that also was from Strixhaven. That not, card was pretty cool. It's not Ram Through, because that's the one... That's from Ikoria, yeah. That's what I keep thinking it is, But too. honestly, that might be an include. Right, exactly. You get um, a lot of cool... Especially with the Giving Trample, being yeah. able to use Ram Through to deal extra damage on top... It's kind of like a fling in that bit. regard. You get your Kiln Feed and Gigantic with Trample and then attack. They block, and then you go, okay, I'm going to also ram through your creature, so I have to assign no damage to that. The rest of the damage goes through, and then my full attack's value goes through. It can be nasty good. Yeah. So that might be something to look at, actually. Absolutely. Cool card. So the next co- next two cards we're going to talk about are super duper niche. And the only reason I'm talking about them (laughs) is because of one other card that I feel like may quietly be one of the most insane cards no one's playing in the format. So that card that I'm talking about is a a Forgotten Realms card, and it's called Deadly Dispute. I'll bring that up real quick. 
It's one in a black. It's an instant. And if you're not familiar with it, you have to sacrifice an artifact or a creature as an additional cost. But you get to draw two cards and create a treasure token. So it's like a village rights, but you can sacrifice artifacts for uh, artifacts to it. And I say it's like a village rights because it makes back a mana. Yeah. So in reality, if you're if you can plan your turns out, you can get this to act as a one mana spell, mm -hmm. given the right circumstance. Not always, but you can. Or you can save it up as a way to accelerate your mana for another turn. So something like Wedding Invitation pairs really well with it because Wedding Invitation enters the battlefield and draws you a card already. It's very much like an Icar Wellspring. Yep. If you want to use it, you can sacrifice it to something like a Deadly Dispute, or you can use its ability to make a creature unblockable this turn. It doesn't mean that, like, you normally this is reverse, right? Like, we see it like, target creature can't block this turn. This one is target creature can't be blocked this turn. Yeah, so it's, it could get in the last couple points you need, or just a, a damage to trigger, like, um, Spectacle if you're in that deck. Absolutely. So. We saw, we, we built a deck that is a lot of fun. It's a white-red artifact-style deck yeah. that this kind of plays really nicely in because it can let us get through uh, the last couple points of damage, right? Like, it's good for, put it, like, I'm going to cast this, it's going to trigger my Firebrand Archers or my Artificers, and then I'm going to use that to make one of them not able to be blocked, and I'm going to go ahead and attack you for lethal now. Yeah, the other Archers of the Reckless Fireweaver. Reckless Fireweaver, yeah. That's the Artificer. Yep. It's it's a cool card. It's also very good in something like the um, the Goblin combo deck, which I've played mm -hmm. before. If you go back to our YouTube, you'll be able to see that. And it works really well in there, too, because you can either sack it to the Deadly Dispute and draw a bunch of cards between its cantrip and the Deadly Dispute. Or you can use it when you're going off. Your opponent may be like, well, I have blockers. If you don't have a trampler, like you're just on like... Um, the little uh, Weaselback red cap or something, yeah. you can use Wedding Invitation to make that unblockable. So it's got a lot of implications in that deck too. So again, super niche. I don't think you're putting this in any deck, but I think there are decks that this card can be taken advantage of pretty nicely. Mm -hmm. And similarly, the last card we're going to talk about is Blood Fountain, which is a single black artifact. When it enters the battlefield, you create a blood token, which is the only blood card I've included on this list. Yeah. The blood is awesome. So baseline, this card's really interesting because it's two artifacts for one single mana. So if you're playing Affinity, so if you have your Mirror Enforcers ready, this is a pretty nasty card to play. It could be, yeah. One mana makes your Mirror Enforcer cost two mana less. So it's kind of like a mana accelerant. It helps you filter your draws because you do get to use that blood token. So if, you have a, if you're a land-heavy hand, you just ditch one and draw something new. So it lets you draw to action. And for four mana, you get to sacrifice this and return up to two creatures from your graveyard to your hand. So late game, it's got implications too. Yeah, there's a, the, the Blood Fountain is actually very strong as far as the list of cards we talked about today too. So Yeah, like, I think it's really cool. Yeah, there's not so much a home for it because there's not a lot of decks that are worried about the late game that much but that being an implication on a card that can do other things is pretty important absolutely this is a card that i would again put in the goblin combo deck so i have to if somebody kills off my critical creatures too early i'm able to use this to get them back late in the game yep. i can use the blood token to filter draws i can use the blood token to be sacrificed to deadly dispute same with the blood fountain itself yeah there's it's there's a lot. Really good. Yeah, it's it's a really cool card. Again, the scary thing about these card the cards we're talking about in the later part of the video is the cards we talked about in the earlier part are so good that it makes these cards hard to play with because they're late game cards. Yeah. So it's if you're gonna play with cards like this and you wanna have like this cool synergy engine, just keep in mind you do have to stay alive through the red deck doing its yes, thing. You do. So you need a lot of removal, you need life gain, you need to think about what you're doing. Well the good news is if you're playing black cards, you get access to something like Tendrils of Corruption, so you can gain a lot of life with that card. Yep. You can play Moment of Craving, so you can gain life early. You get a lot of cheap interaction for yeah. black. So you can make it work. But just be cognizant, your deck does have to do that. And then it takes deck slots, right? Like you're taking away from your synergy parts of your deck because you're using that for removal. 
So if you're going to do that, you need to be cognizant of it. I like it because if I'm playing against a deck that's a little slower, it works really well in the Goblin Combo deck. It also is just cheap fodder if I need it. The Blood Token really helps out when I have just an extra mana on a random third turn or something. Like, cool, yeah. let me just get rid of this card and I'll draw something else. Like, I need either my uh, first day of class or my uh, Goblin with Persist, whatever the heck he's called. <laughs> I can never remember the card names when we do these videos. Uh, Goblin with Persist is actually just not in my brain, because I was thinking, this also goes into the uh, the rat deck. Yeah, oh yeah, 100%. It's cheap. And it's when, an how many odd times number have we casting about, cost. Yeah, odd number casting cost. If you're going to play the rats deck, if you're just like, I don't care, they're doing a pauper event, and I want to get the little prize when I get my three wins or whatever, or two wins or whatever the, the layout of the event is, and you want to just play the rats deck and hurry up, don't ignore a card like Blood Fountain, because it'll let you deal with Land Flood later by using the Blood Token. It'll let you return your lost rats later in the game if it goes that long. And minimally, it gives you something to do on turns 1 and 3, either as your first spell of the game or your double spell for the first time in the game, which are both critical. Yeah, absolutely. So don't, don't screw around. Play your Supernatural Staminas. Play your Blood... I mean, we have an effect from AFR that brings them back now. With plus 1, plus 1, there's an effect from Crimson Val that does it now. Yep. So you have a lot of ability to play your one... Like, just don't sleep on those one-mana spells, and Blood Fountain's a really nice one to help fill out the deck. So don't just jam 20 land, 40 rats. Give it a little bit more critical thinking than that. Yep. Critical thinking. But yeah, if you uh, if you haven't learned anything from these paupers, or this is your fir- this primer, this is your first one, man, it's just... Pa- paupers are brewer's paradise. Absolutely. So, just play something that's cool. Just be aware of the big three decks and just kind of work on that to the best of your ability. Just know they're out there. They're The decks that are good are really good, but they're all beatable, right? Like, it's mm-hmm. not just... It's not an absolute... There hasn't been stakes high enough to make people really focus too deeply on Pauper, so play with cards. It may, it may not be cards we've mentioned. You may be like, oh, you guys are totally off on this. Oh, yeah. If we miss something, like, let us know. Let us know in the comments. Jump in our Discord. We're always down to play some Pauper. Check out our stream on Twitch on Sunday nights. If you want to jam Pauper, get in the chat and go, yo, Pauper, let's throw down. We will absolutely accept Pauper challenges on Sundays on our Twitch channel. So I'll make that a do all those thing. things. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. A great way to spend some channel points. Yeah. So definitely do that. I'm not going to keep doing all the YouTube stuff. You know the deal. If you like the video, do the stuff. I'm yeah. not going to pressure you. But... We're here every set with these Pauper Primers. You can watch pop-up video here. We're going to get more of those out to you. Twitch channel, we're playing Pauper. We're playing Limited. So check that out if you're into slinging a lot of commons. We are definitely a good source for you to hopefully learn something. Minimally, you'll learn what not to do. At the least. That's it. That's all I have to say. Bye.